It is an amazing opportunity to host a conversation with both of you, um, not just because of everybody here and the fact that we're capturing this um, to be able to kind of for later, but also the buzz that this has had across our entire team. So I'm going to pass over, like Erica, can we come to you first? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Erica Shimizu Banks. I'm the founder of Shiso, an intersectional equity consulting firm. It started at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I've been very fortunate in that um, it's blossomed during that time. Uh, but I think what most likely brings me here is my life before that. So uh, I'm really glad you actually encourage us to like brag about ourselves. I think as women, especially as women of color in spaces like this, it's really can be difficult and intimidating to do so. There are so many barriers to success um, in so many industries and in that your successes as a woman of color are seen as threats. Um, so I've definitely downplayed that throughout my career. And in fact, before I started my business, I'd wanted to for years. Um, but I felt like I needed the structure, the stability, the safety of like a big name brand company, um, and the like an anonymity of it as well uh, to kind of be safe. Um, but I ended up getting pushed out by the industry and it forced me to do what I wanted to do. And so in a strange way, I'm really thankful for that. And uh, the reason why I was forced out of tech is that um, I worked at Google for seven years um, on patent policy, on leadership recruiting. So basically every president, every head of country, um, every executive that was really making decisions at the company, I played a part in their hiring. And so it was really interesting in that I got to kind of see the future of tech um, from this perspective that I think a lot of folks don't think about when they think about how a company's direction is shaped. Um, and then from that experience, I missed policy because previous to that, I was a political appointee in the Obama administration um, and worked on environmental justice policy, which very much informs how I do my work now, focusing and centering people of color, um, indigenous communities, uh, people who are most impacted by policies and their worst impacts, um, the worst uh, outcomes of that, um, and having a holistic sense of how to do things. Um, but um, all of that to say, I bring that to my business, but um, in tech, I brought that ethos to my work regardless of what I was doing. And so I ended up on policy and legal, uh, working on patent policies, uplifting um, small business owners, especially black small business owners in the DC area. Um, and women entrepreneurs, I started a nonprofit, in fact, to support women entrepreneurs to this day that supports about 4,000 women in the DC area with their businesses. That's amazing. Um, yeah, thank you. And to wrap it up, I ended up at Pinterest. Um, and I was told that because of this ethos, because of this commitment to social justice, to a holistic sense of how to do things, um, to uplifting marginalized communities, they wanted me to start an office and be their head representative to the US government. But in fact, all they wanted was a face, uh, the face of a black woman in particular. And so when I started to let that ethos influence the decisions I was making on behalf of the company, both internally and externally, um, they didn't like it. And I, in the, I, I ended up filing a, com a complaint um, for discrimination based on sex and racism um, and uh, left the company as a result of that and helped pass a law so that now in California, it was called the Silence No More Act, it passed last year. So for anyone that works in California, take note, um, and now in Washington state as well, um, no matter for what document you sign, an NDA, a non-disparagement agreement, et cetera, you will always have the right to your story and your experience working in any place, um, whether that's experiencing sexual harassment, racial discrimination, et cetera, thanks to the law that we passed um, based on my experience at Pinterest. And so I'm really excited for that to make its way nationally. And that's a protection I think we should all have, the right to our story. And especially the right to our trauma uh, and to uh, recount that trauma and, and help heal from that. So um, all of that brought me to my business and that brought me to you today. So thanks for having me. <laughs> Um, I also just wanted to add, um, we were just talking about earlier, um, Eric has also studied at Oxford University with MSc in Environmental Policy. She was also on Forbes 30 Under 30 list, uh, which is incredible. So I thought I'd just add those two bits in there. Um, and also you studied a bit at Princeton and you were at Seattle as well for your undergraduate. So, Sorry. and she just said to me she might want to do a PhD, which I love, but oh my God. <laughs> another more years of study, which is incredible. So thank you so much, Erica. Thank you. Um, Francis, let's hear your story. Yeah. Hi, my name is Francis Haugen, and um, people uh, mostly know me as the Facebook whistleblower. So in the fall of 2021, so about 15 months ago, 
I'm going to have to speak louder now. Um, uh, in the fall, in, in September of 2021, um, uh, the Wall Street Journal published a series of articles on uh, 22,000 pages of documents that I brought out of Pinterest. On uh, Pinterest, sorry. I worked at Pinterest also. And I have, <laughs> ooh, I have some stories on Pinterest. We have some tea to share. We, don't, we won't go there right now. It ended up becoming a, a very big international deal because um, we ended up expanding to a consortium of 157 outlets around the world. Um, and it, the range of reporting was really, really broad. So the reason I came forward was I saw that in, for billions of people around the world, Facebook is the internet. Right, the, the, they went into those countries, they subsidized the data, they got enough penetration that instead of putting up a website, you use a Facebook page because there's enough people who otherwise can't access it. And uh, this was even more so five years ago when data was a lot more expensive and through legacy you know, network effects, there's still the internet for billions of people. But the same people who have no other options for how to access the internet in their language don't get any safety protections because Facebook has wed itself to the idea that they're not going to design for safety, they're gonna go and take the bad things down after the fact. And the thing they didn't tell anyone was when you do that, you have to translate your systems over and over and over again. And they've made some progress since I came out. They expanded to covering 200 languages around the world. But there are like four or 5,000 languages. And the places in the world that are the most fragile are the ones that often have, or have the most linguistic diversity. And so uh, and I'm a big speaker around linguistic equity, around like how do we design to respect dignity and the autonomy of users. And, um, and I founded a nonprofit called Beyond the Screen, which is focused on this question of how could, we, instead of having a couple hundred people around the world that understand how these systems work, what would it take to have a million people around the world who really could understand that level? Because the only way we will actually heal social media is if we can bring more people and more kinds of people to the table. Um, I am also uh, an advocate around um, disabilities. So I'm a survivor of being paralyzed beneath my, my knees. Um, and I had to come back and relearn and walk and all those things. And um, I'm a big uh, speaker about celiac and uh, neuropathy because I think neuropathy is an undertreated disease in this country. What Francis also forgot to mention. Oh. Humble ladies, very humble, um, is you've got a degree uh, in electrical and computing engineering from Arlen College, which is MIT, right? Um, it, it was founded by a bunch of MIT professors that wanted to do intersectional education. Right. I did get into MIT, but I went to Olin, yeah. um, and I was part of the first graduating class there. Wow, and you also have an MBA from Harvard. Okay, so let, let's just put that out there. <laughs> um, and I just want to kind of bring it back, like with Francis, like, um, Actually, you may not realize this, but your, the, the whistleblowing report that you did and the testimony that you did and the facts that you shared about Facebook um, and the fact that 13.5% of girls that are kind of like on those platforms have suicidal thoughts are from the study in the UK, that was the catalyst for us coming off social media also, or from meta um, platforms. And I just want to say like, it was like, it was incredible um, and for sharing it. And it was such an impact for us at, as a, at a brand level. So I just wanted to bring that back. And that's why for us, like having what well, you both here as part of this conversation um, is so important. So um, over the last four days, we've been having like, positive, optimistic um, conversations about the future. And that's really what this house here um, has been all about. And we started our four days with our CDO, Jack Constantine, who's in the back, which to be fair, he won't say it, but actually it's probably really down to him that, and for your statistic that we're not on meta. So he was advocating for that for a long time before your report came out. So it's, it's a massive point to Jack that we, yeah, that we kind of took that leap. Um, and really channeling about our big tech rebellion, kind of coming away from the big players and channeling that small tech energy. Um, and we wanted to end, obviously, these four, these four days um, on kind of moving that conversation to the future of social. So that's kind of what we want to kind of go into. And Erica, I was just, I've been, I've done a lot of research. I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, but at the that. World Bank Youth Summit, you said that you felt that we were due the big next new platform, like that we'd TikTok and Snapchat and they've been there, but like, you know, we, we're waiting for that next big one. And then Francis, in your testimony, that, you know, to the Senate, you said that you believe social media has the potential to enrich our lives and society. So I want to know how we can go about creating it. Okay, so I'm going to take us to 2030. 
um, out. And the reason why I personally want to do that is that my daughter is going to be 12 in 2030. So she's going to be at the age where on these platforms, I would like to think that it's going to be a safer space than where it is today. So can you paint me a picture of like what your vision um, of so the social media landscape could look like in 2030? I think almost certainly by 2030, uh, we will actually not have any under 13 year olds on the platforms, which sounds crazy to anyone who has kids, right? Right now there's lots of eight year olds, nine year olds, 10 year olds that are on these platforms. But the reality is we are now seeing enough data that there is a danger window from 10 to 13 when kids go through puberty and literally their brains start changing. They get more, oxyto uh, more oxytocin, more dopamine receptors. And it means that a compliment to a 12-year-old girl, like no one in this room is ever going to get a compliment as sublime or a criticism as piercing as what a 12-year-old girl can receive. Right, thank God. Right, like we've all moved beyond that. Um, but people are seeing, like, uh, this is, there's a real danger here and we're seeing it percolate out into things like suicide rates. Um, we know how to keep the kids off the platforms. That the, the reason why kids are on there is not because we don't know how to find them. It's because the platforms are afraid that if they're the first mover, they will give up on the next generation. So the first thing is kids under 13, maybe even kids under like 15 or 16, are probably not going to be on platforms by 2030. That's my first prediction. Okay. Second thing, um, because there's just things on, in what, I, I just need to trust me on this one, there's things in motion right now that are making it look like that's what the world's gonna look like. But the second thing is I think we're gonna see more smaller social networks that are more community driven, right? That they're gonna be about an affinity community where you say, this matters to me. There's a creator and I really love their ethos. There's a brand, I really love their ethos. They've cultivated a community and that's where I do my online socializing. Because I want you to remember, Facebook in 2008, I don't think actually was that dangerous. You know, in 2008, there were no algorithms that directed your attention. All the content you received was from people you chose to receive it from. And what happened was, over time, the products changed and changed and changed behind the scenes. Like, you kept seeing little streams of rectangles, and you're like, I know what I'm using. But in reality, the products were shifting under your feet. And I think we're going to start seeing more things that are community driven. They're more where people control them. And people are going to realize, oh, when you don't have an addictive algorithm that's like giving you exactly what you want, you know, it doesn't make you feel as bad. Or you don't spend as much time that you regret and you can still get socialization. And so I think those are going to be trends that we see. We see things that are about intentionality. They're about things that matter to people. And they ha are community moderated and community driven. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Well, when I first um, saw the, read this question, uh, my overthinking brain was like, wait, is this about an actual like prediction in terms of reality or my ideal? Because actually I did a panel a couple, day, couple days ago uh, with the Meta Oversight Board, um, and one of the questions was, wow. what kind of world would you like to see online? What kind of online experience would you like to have in the future? And so with that in mind, I kind of came up with two kind of trains of thoughts here. Uh, trains of thought here. Um, so I think we'll start with the negative. <laughs> we'll start with the downer and then we'll work our way up. Um, I think, you know, the reality of 2030, much like uh, what Francis said, I do think that um, online platforms will be more segmented, more siloed, and more community driven. I hope they will be. I think we're already starting to see that with Mastodon kind of on the more positive side. Um, but on the more negative side, I think that also means privatization of platforms. Um, and if the like as we see with Twitter, and we can see what's happening there when you have uh, the equivalent of like an authoritarian dictator, uh, but on an, in, a, in a company versus a country. It's actually having a similar, sp uh, similar effect of driving people off the platform, increase in hate, um, discrimination, bias, and a lot of that, those online threats actually turning into real world danger for so many people, especially marginalized communities. And so I think as well, you know, looking at the regulatory and political landscape, um, as someone who worked in the regulatory, or, well, in, in the political space um, for a few years, the reality is that government is very slow mm -hmm. um, and entrenched regardless of, you know, especially in the US of who's in power. I think in the EU and the UK, things move a, a lot faster as we saw with the, the prime minister. <laughs> Changeovers, things can move really quickly. Yeah, we'll, right? we'll gloss over that one. Not a good start of our political. But you know, or you know, Brexit, whatever. We can talk about a lot of things. But um, you know, it doesn't actually mean that there will be swift positive change. Even if you look at Chile, right, with the election of uh, the youngest 
right president in their history with like a socialist, like a communist student organizer background. He put together this amazing constitution that would have done everything we need to kind of do for the environment, and it didn't pass. So government's going to move very slowly, and I don't think we'll see acting any action really on like the research you pointed out, unfortunately, that would safeguard children and teens online, that would um, put you know stronger verification measure, measure, measure stronger like safety infra infrastructure so that we could actually determine who's online, who's a bot. So I I just don't see it. So um, yeah, can, yeah, can I give a, a counterpoint? Me. So I I assume so I'm I'm going to be a downer. I just assume there's no laws passing in the United States. Yeah, but all of our strategies are based around how do we drive change when we can't pass a law? Like our constitution is. You know, it's, it's, it's ancient, it's like sclerotic, it's like a big problem. But there's other ways that we change things. So laws are actually lagging indicators. It means we have established new norms, we have new expectations around what does it mean to transgress those norms, then we write a law. We talk about something we call the ecosystem of accountability. So if we're gonna talk about cars, there are litigators that know what a cut corner looks like, and they'll hold you responsible if you cut that corner. There's investors that know what risk looks like and how to manage for long-term returns. It's things like legislative aides who know what's possible with laws. It's things like mothers against drunk driving who keep things in the front of like people's minds even between news cycles. And when it comes to social media, we are missing the entire ecosystem of accountability. So my nonprofit works specifically in that space. Like we work on the idea of like how do we empower litigators? How do we empower investors? And I think one of the things that's going to be a major driving force is um, like investors want to act. Absolutely. Like, like uh, litigators are. There's a lot, a lot of class action lawsuits going right now on yes, social media. Absolutely. And so all of these things are are levers that begin to push and push and pull. Yeah. So I hope that happens as well, which will feed into kind of like my ideal. 2030 social media landscape, but I think you know the reality is that we're not going to see any changes in law. We're not going to have a privacy law, even though companies and legislators have been saying they want one in the U.S. Um, but what we may see is the breakup of companies, these monop the tech giants and the monopolies, into uh, pseudo independent companies that will then create similar fiefdoms to what Elon Musk is doing now at, at Twitter, um, and how you see subsidiaries acting um, within companies to give the appearance of being broken up. And what that means is that I don't actually think we'll see much improvement or change in online infrastructure. Um, there might be more like frictionless payments. Um, but if anything, I think more people are going to be online and actually against their will because there also isn't enough uh, you know, drivers of innovation outside of uh, VC money, outside of um, you know, folks who, conglomerates and, and basically just incredibly rich, wealthy people who got that way through conservative policies um, and discriminatory policies and action that benefited them. Um, and so they're going to perpetuate those continuous um, you know, systems online to entrench their power and money. And so if anything, I think actually, you know, I'm, I'm sure students are going to be required to be on social media platforms or in the metaverse to attend school. And I'm sure that companies will find a way to advertise about themselves during the, you know, in that online metaverse classroom. Um, so that's the kind of like Debbie Downer view, kind of very Debbie Downer view of like what we'll be facing in the next few years. But my ideal 2030 um, is one in which there is a frictionlessness but not about how to pay for things, but about how to find the causes you care about, how to connect with the people you love who maybe live in, a, in opposite sides of the world, how to support people, uh, be that you know, marginalized folks, be that folks who you know, have to use GoFundMes for, you know, to address a tragedy that's happened in their life, um, for sex workers who are by choice or by force in this industry and have to get paid for their work um, or want to put their content out there. Um, I'd love to see social media become um, a place where the seamlessness between our real lives and our online lives actually helps us and makes things easier in a beneficial way as opposed to one that's driven by commerce. Um, I'd also love to see by 2030 that most companies take the tack you take um, at Lush, but also that they've taken at Google, in fact, and making sure that their um, data centers are powered with clean energy, with renewables, et cetera. Um, so that, yeah, that's my ideal. And of course, a place where hate is not allowed 
and eliminated, where people are safe to not just um, be themselves and find their own community, but can safely enter an online space without being threatened by another community. Um, and also where ideas are representative of people and not, um, you know, an amplification of extremist point of views that are then scaled up to then have real world harm. I think it's interesting, we had a, another panelist on Friday, um, Michaela Jean, talk about, and she said that like, which is quite interesting that obviously like millennials and boomers were basically responsible for the trolling on social, but the Gen Zers and the, and the alphas coming up because they won't have had that online offline separation that we have had and had to grow up. To, we've always had a barrier that we put in place that they like, she feels more positive that they're going to be the ones that actually kind of move away from some of more of that negative hate space, which you can't get, it may not get rid of it because that's a, you know, that's, that's not going to be that, that simple solve. But she felt more positive that the younger generation, because they're not going to have this separation, it's just going to be life versus what we see um, as millennials and kind of like older um, in terms of how we do it. What would you say to that? Like, do you think that's kind of like reality and you're seeing that a bit with Gen Z and that, or, or actually you're like, I don't agree with that. Like, <laughs> there, There's a really good study that uses the game Halo has anyone, does, is anyone old enough to, yeah. So Halo was a video game, once upon a time, and people wore these big mechanical suits and like shotguns at each other on this alien world. And these researchers came in there and they had three experimental conditions. They had one where there was a male voice that would say like, nice shot, watch out, it's over there, like that kind of thing. They had a female voice that said the exact same things and then they had a text condition where they just typed the comments. And they just saw how, how did other players treat these characters, because everyone looks the same. You're this big, m m boxy mechanical suit. And what they found was strong male players do not harass women in, virtu in, this, in this virtual space, at least. The people who harass the woman, or the woman player, because one, one person played all these conditions, uh, were mediocre and poor performing men. What do they mean by mediocre and poor performance? Um, like you can look at the scores, right? You can see how these people oh, are doing. Mean the actual, their actual performance. Their actual performance. And, and because if, you're, are, if you can bully a woman who's doing better than you out of the space, you move up, right? And I think one of the things I'm excited about Gen Z and, and the alphas is that it's more and more socially uh, condemned to, to use those tactics. Right, I think there's a lot more consensus that that's unacceptable, and I think that's a really positive thing. But well, I think as long as there's kind of those insecurities in people, people will will lash out. Yeah. Well, I I hope that Gen Z is able to kind of carry on that. I don't even want to call it idealistic; it's I ideal driven, but it's not necessarily naive. Yeah. Um, I just hope they're able to maintain that ethos as they enter the workforce as many of you are entering the workforce and be, make the core of the workforce, um, I think the things that uh, dampen that optimism and that, um, that altruism are the forces of capitalism, um, burnout and stress and being overloaded and things. And so, you know, kind of going back to, or not going back to something, but to bring up also like, you know, when we think about harms online and, and, and um, bias online and discrimination, et cetera, and how so much of that is, is like driven by algorithms or al amplified by it, et cetera, um, a question I often think about is how intentional is this? And I, you know, as someone who's worked in tech, but also as someone who's worked at nonprofits and in the government, you know, in a regulatory kind of role um, at the Office of Management and Budget, um, I think what you see is like, there's a lot of really well-meaning people out there who want to work on their ideals and make them real, but that is ground out of them because they have to pay bills, because they have to succeed in workplaces that are oppressive or discriminatory or that overload them. That even, you know, even your typical white male engineer, you know, may not want his point of view to be the one that dominates a product, but when you're put in a sprint, when you're not given the time to do your research, to bring in outside sources, when you're working on something that's like super top secret, right, and in beta or whatever, you're not allowed to bring in other people's ideas. And so you're like, well, I have a night 
and I guess I'm just going to put what I like in here. And then that ships out to billions of people. And so, yeah, sometimes it's intentional, as we've seen, and oftentimes it is. But also, in an infrastructure sense, it's not. And so I think, you know, as long as we continue to look at things at their root and systemic source, we will hopefully put the guardrails in place and change our systems and how we work, how we build, so that Gen Z's idealism can remain and they can actually like manifest what they believe in, what I think many of us believe in and want out of our lives in the products and platforms we use. And, and to give a little bit of encouragement, um, last year the European Union pl passed a generational law called the Digital Services Act. So for the first time anywhere in the world, citizens of the European Union have a right to be informed of the harms that companies know about their own products. And if they gloss over and they don't pay attention to an issue of, say, a marginalized community, the commission can ask and say, hey, I noticed you didn't, you didn't even address this harm. Like, have you investigated it? We want you to go do more research. And for the first time, there will be independent access to data off of platforms. And the reason why that matters is a lot of algorithmic systems, if you don't intentionally put a guardrail in, the algorithm is just going to take the shortest path to get there. So for example, when I worked at Pinterest, um, I worked on a project that was around putting skin tone filters into search. Because we found that when you search for something like eyeshadow, no, no content came back from people of color. Right? And the reason for that wasn't they came and said, oh, content from people of color is bad content, or our brand is for white people. It's that maybe 20% of users or 25% of users were people of color. And the algorithm said, oh, that content just doesn't perform as well when you search for eyeshadow. And so we're going to be entering into a place where we can actually say, you have to have guardrails on the things. You have to publish your metrics. And that allows for more incentives internally for people to follow their hearts. Wow. Uh, I wondered, like, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the future, what it could look like, what we hope it will look like. Um, how would we get, like, what were the most important things that would have needed to happen um, if we got to that kind of future vision of what, of what social could be? Well, as a policy person, my, as with someone in a background in policy, my default is like more laws and regulation. Yeah. <laughs> so much of, um, of content moderation, so many of the policies, all of this, mm -hmm. even the good stuff, is all voluntary. And so companies get to get a huge pat on the back when they do something right, right? Because they chose to do this. It's like altruistic, and they deserve that, like Lush, right? Um, but you know, also companies that do the bare minimum but are able to, you know, spin it as like, oh, this is a huge thing. It's never existed before or it's going to affect millions of people. It's like, well, that's very relative given how much money you have, how much time you've had to implement this, and how many user users you have or how much money you have to, like, address and scale markets. Um, so when it's all voluntary, most people are not going to be like companies like Lush, they're going to do the bare minimum and set a floor. They're not going to set a ceiling. Um, and so unless we have legislation with, uh, and regulations with real consequences that matter to companies, they're going to continue to break the rules. They're going to continue to operate outside of um, you know, what you know, users in the world really desires and what people say they want. Um, I think you know a great example of this is with the fines that sort of that that the um, FTC, for example, has leveled ag against Facebook. Mm -hmm. Record fines for the agency. I think it was like five, yeah, five billion. billion. Mm -hmm. That's how much Facebook makes a quarter, four years, five years ago. And, and the day that they so, announced the fine, the stock price went up because it could have been bigger. And they were like, "Ooh, yeah, yeah." So then that that brings me to the second place, like in, in lieu of legislation, we have shareholders, especially for these larger companies. And it's been really encouraging to see so many activist shareholders and groups come forward to pressure and really inform shareholders that, hey, you have a piece of this pie, you have influence, you vote on how this company supposedly is like run. Um, you can influence how they do business. You can ask for environmental social governance goals. You can ask for improvement in equity, inequities, et cetera, and addressing these things. Um, you can ask for equity audits. Um, I've been working on um, legislation at the federal and local level to make sure that companies are audited for their practices and how they impact populations by outside um, forces like ac the academy and by civil society, et cetera. So um, that's another place, and shareholders have really taken that up more than you know legislators have. Um, so that's another avenue. And then the third place is public pressure. 
um, continue to use your voice to shape how these companies run because you know they depend on you. The DSA passed last year. It was the last big, like, major victory. Um, Canada is going to be introducing le legislation this year. Um, I have this this fantasy that the Canadians are going to come save us because, like, um, we because got a the, lot of Canadians in the audience here. Because <laughs> because the, the, the they they've built a lot of coalitions. And like, I think one of the things that's really easy to gloss over in the United States is yes, teen suicide is really, really tragic. It's a big deal. We have to talk about teen mental health. But there's a lot of places in the world where people are dying. Like we're talking tens of thousands of people dying from social media caused violence, like ethnic violence. Myanmar, Ethiopia, it's like 400,000 people died in, in Ethiopia during uh, the conflict over the last couple of years. Um, and over and over again, Agencies like the United, United Nations have said Facebook was responsible through their negligence. And I want to really pick up on a thing you said, which was these are voluntary actions today. You know, they don't have to tell us how they work. All around the world, uh, governmental officials have said to us, we asked them how many p moderators spoke our language and they won't tell us. Doesn't matter if it's the French, the Germ Germans, Brazilians, no, they'll never get an answer. And one of the things that I learned only in the last couple of weeks was in the last six months, they've halved the number of content moderators in East Africa, right? And it's because it's their year of efficiency. And so we need to pass laws like the DSA. We need to support the Canadians. Like I'm going to be uh, a fellow at McGill this year. I'm going to do everything I can to get you know the first role of the Canadian coalition going. Um, because we have to have transparency if we ever want to force accountability. Yeah, wow, such important points. I just like, oh, got to get on, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> we'll stop to do. And we can do it. We can do it, folks. We can. Like, what do you think in terms of like that our major barriers, our challenges in getting to where we need to go? Like, what do we need to move out of the way? Either we want to take that first? Oh. And I, I think one of the most important things is to really acknowledge how much money Facebook particularly has spent on, on selling a lie to the public. Facebook has spent a huge sum of money, right? The $250 million they spent on the oversight board was actually part of propagating this lie because the oversight board does not do generalized oversight of Facebook. It's only for if your content is moderated and you think it shouldn't have been, you can appeal to the board. Right? It, it's about the idea that the only path to safety is content moderation, censorship. So they can come out there and say, I hear you. I hear about these horrible things. But you know, this is a problem between freedom of speech and safety. And that trade-off is so hard. Like, and, and people sit there and they're like, I don't, I don't know if I can really compromise those things. And it's a false choice. We have lots and lots of solutions where we can make the algorithms reward extremism uh, to a lesser extent, right? It's things like how we choose what signals are propagated. It's how we, do we reward people who can speak across the aisle? Facebook ran experiments where they said, hey, someone who can constructively talk to people on the left and the right in the United States is actually doing a very hard and nuanced thing. We should reward that. And when you boost people who can do that, you get less violence, you get less hate speech, you get less uh, like people reporting being harassed. And yet people engage with the platform just a little tiny bit less, right? So they never shipped it, right? And so it's one of these things where we have to get beyond the idea that we don't have options. Because I brought out a huge number of documents to show that Facebook knows there are ways to make us safer that don't involve content moderation and we can push forward. Um, again, that was a, another question on our panel on Saturday. Like, why is why is there a continual propping up of this false dichotomy between freedom of expression and safety online? Um, but you know, I think what needs to I rolled my eyes because I'm like I'm just like capitalism. It's my answer to everything. Just take out the power and the money. And I think um, how do we do that? One public support, philanthropic support of uh, you know, grassroots and community-based initiatives to get folks online to get new um, platforms out there and to build new technology. I think um, you know, with these larger companies, they, they monopolize um, social media and our online lives and our online spaces because they have so much money and money equals power and that money um, comes from a lot of private sources with private interests. So we have to get that out of how we build things, especially things that people rely on for their daily lives. Like you pointed out, like 
in India, for example, Facebook is the only way to get online in many cities, right? Um, to me, you know, when I was at Google, um, I was on the patent team, and I'd look at things that were building out and see our patents for things, and I'd be like, I'd joke like in the office, like, when is Google going to be a pu become a public utility? And like, I would laugh, and everyone's looking at me like, shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> what is wrong with you? Do you want to get fired? And I was like, I don't understand why that's such a controversial idea. Yeah. Everyone uses Google to search for things online. Like when A is like just having an internet connection going to be seen for what it is, a public right and good, yeah. because we have to do life online, especially, you know, the pandemic showed us that, especially in times of intense, you know, global trauma and upheaval, people relied on the internet. Mm -hmm. So that should A, be a public utility, and B, like the larger search engines and the infrastructure to navigate the internet should be public. They should be free, they should be accessible. And that means that should be funded perhaps by taxpayer dollars as opposed to investor dollars. And especially when your investors are like Andreessen Horowitz, who's, you know, founder's father is a massive Trump supporter who said that African Americans were lucky to be brought over to America because they got free food and got to live in this country. This is someone who's invested in basically every single company that we all use online. So yes, their viewpoints are shaping how we interact online and what shows up online and what's prioritized. If this were publicly funded, that wouldn't be the case. Um, but the caveat to that is not only should things be publicly funded, the trade-off for public funding should be accountability and public accountability via, via that through regulation or through outside bodies brought together by government to review the actions of these companies and make sure that those public investments are put for public good, um, you know, that's actually a model that already exists, but the oversight is always lacking. And so alongside making things public, we have to raise the accountability. A uh, little fun fact on that one. Um, some municipalities have founded their own ISPs. They've said like, hey, we want to make sure everyone gets high speed internet. We know if we own it, we can get it for a lower price. We can have higher reliability, better penetration, even in marginalized neighborhoods. And, and in, in many states, those, those have gone trumped because they will pass a law at the state level saying you can't do that because it you know it pu pushes out competition from the private parties so you can't have a publicly funded utility and so I, I strongly support we need to have more of those public models i think one of the other things i'm super excited about is that people are playing with the business model so how many of you have heard of nebula before you know they often see on youtube they'll be like you know, if you, I watch a lot of science videos, so I hear about these things. Um, it's a, it's a, a video platform that is owned by creators. And so they can give a better um, revenue split. They can, they can pay them more for the content they create. And one of the things we're seeing in some of the newer experimental social networks is they're giving rights to people who create. They're saying, hey, you, the backs of these companies came off of content we provided through the signals and the data we provided. Why don't we get a voice and an ability to influence the decisions on these platforms for all the labor we've put in? And people really respond to things like that. And so I think there's some, some chances for different ways forward from, from playing with the business model. One last question, if that's OK. Um, so we're all sat here today, and we've obviously heard about all the, the things that we hope to be and the things that need to change. But us as individuals, like if you were to tell us like one thing, what can we take away? What can we do? Actions that we can take from this piece to get to that vision, to support what we want to see in the future, what would it be? Yeah, well, I can think of a couple things, but they're related. One, join a union. Form a union. Um, going back to the public piece, you know, a, a large part of that public piece is also putting power and ownership back in the hands of the workers and the community. So join a union, and if you can't join a union, join a co-op, even if that's your marketplace, or find one online. To your point about business models, um, I, I am an advisor to a, a, a burgeoning social media app called Lita, um, which is about protecting people and their privacy from the beginning, like through the span of life. Um, in a way that's ethical, and it's going to be a co-op-based model of ownership. And there are other platforms out there that are doing the same. So you know, show show folks that that model can work, and that you know your contributions matter. So join a union, join a co-op. I, I worry a lot that um, so you know we talked about the idea of that that um, 
the interests of capital and power get propagated into the design decisions. When you sit there and dissociate with your phone, and, and guess what, they've done studies, they can inject random posts into your Instagram feed, and when you're doom scrolling, you're not actually processing what you're seeing, right? Um, when we sit there and dissociate, when we numb ourselves, when we self-soothe by just our scrolling, we, we give away a little bit of our power, right? We don't turn and build relationships with other people to be the thing that soothes us. We don't go out and find ways of socializing in person. Um, and so one of the things I always really encourage people is us regaining awareness of our relationship with these technologies and making decisions about, is this how we want to spend our time? Is actually really important for us reclaiming our agency and our power. And so I encourage all of you, you, you all have phones that have little uh, things that will tell you how much time you spend on each app. And I, I encourage you to check it out. Like, just see how much time did you spend last week or the week before that. Ask yourself questions like, is this how I want to spend my life? You know, when I get to the end of my life, I'm going to have a very limited number of hours on this earth. If I propagate that number forward in time, is that a decision I'm going to regret? And the second thing is, guess what? If you, if you do have a, a phone habit, I have a phone habit. My husband's in the front row. He can tell you, YouTube and I, late nights, it's not a good thing. Um, but. But you can make your screen black and white, which is something he taught me, right? All of our phones now have the ability to go grayscale, and it makes them less seductive. It makes them less pleasurable. And that can actually help you step back, right? You can do things like put your phone into nighttime mode, and it will actually color shift it as if it, like, you know, the sun was going down. That can help you, again, reclaim your sleep, reclaim your energy. Because we have to stop uh, just uh, being m uh, mindless companions to our phones. Our f f phones are tools for us, and we need to take that first step if we want to do more things and actually change the world. Huge thank you to, to Erica and to Francis for being here. So massive round of applause. Thank you so much. Can I give a pep talk? Yeah, sure. Ooh, uh, does anyone want, uh, we talked about a lot of dark stuff. I talk a lot about dark stuff all the time. And so I find ending on a high note is really good for going on the world. Every communication technology we have ever invented was disruptive. You know, we invented the printing press. We started teaching people to read. We literally got people spreading around pamphlets saying, there might be a witch next door. How do you know if you need to burn your neighbor, right? Like, it was really disruptive. We got cheap printing presses, also known as newspapers. We got yellow journalism. We had wars fought over misinformation. But we adapted. We developed things like journalism schools and journalistic ethics, laws about things like media concentration or media ownership transparency, liability rules. We adapted. When we invented radio, radio was a huge force in World War II. Right? For the first time, people had intimate personal relationships with their leaders, and people weaponized that technology to ha empower dictators to rise forward. But afterwards, we adapted more transparency laws, public investment in media, public television, public radio. It's much stronger in Europe than in the United States. Every time before we have invented a technology, it has been chaotic. People have died. It was bad. It's easy for us to feel overwhelmed right now because this is overwhelming. But every time before we have learned, we have figured out different things to do, and we have adapted. And so as you go out, I want you to believe we will do better and we will do something different because every time before, we have. And so let's go do this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.